Well, good morning. Who's excited to be at church today? I am. Woo-woo. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Listen, I don't know how your team fared yesterday. I don't know, I don't know how your fantasy football team's going to do this afternoon, fellas, but I know that God's in the house this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen, amen. Hey, thank you so very much for being here with us this morning. I believe today is going to be an incredible day. Uh, we are right in the middle of family month. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, how we can love our spouses today. Uh, and that's going to be an incredible sermon uh, this afternoon uh, when we get to that. Uh, before we get there, though, a couple of announcements. Look to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Neighbor. Pay attention. Pay attention. All right? You don't want to miss these things. Look, you'll be commenting on Facebook in a week from now. I mean, what time did this start? I'm going to tell you because you didn't pay attention. All right? So a couple of things coming up. Everybody say October the 3rd. October the 3rd is our homecoming, friends and family homecoming. Uh, Make sure you are here that day. It's going to be an incredible day of looking to our past and how faithful God has been uh, while looking to our future and what God is going to continue to do and continue to bless us. It's going to be a good time. We're going to have hamburgers and hot dogs uh, after service. We're going to have bounce houses for the kids. So make sure you're here. We do ask one thing. Church is going to provide the meat, but if you guys can bring hot dog and hamburger buns, uh, we need them on the 26th, okay? The 26th, September 26th, if you guys can read some hot dogs and hamburger buns, that would help us out greatly. And so make sure uh, when you run to Kroger today, pick up an extra bag. That would be fantastic. Uh, Also, everybody say October the 23rd. Uh, If you have a daughter back in Legacy Kids, this event is for you. It's our Love by the King Princess Ball. Uh, We have only done one of these because of that deadly uh, thing that we won't mention uh, while we had to cancel it last year. Um, But we're going to get back to our Love by the King Princess Ball. And it's just a night to make our girls feel loved and cherished and know that they are cared for not only by you and by this church, but by their Father in Heaven uh, who loves them so much. So if you have a daughter, make plans to attend that. Uh, Miss Callie next week is going to be giving out uh, actual physical uh, invites and so that way we'll have all the information but October the 23rd make sure you put that on your calendar uh, we have lots of ladies events going on because October the 28th through the 30th is the she contends conference ladies are you excited yes. now we're gonna try the answer so ladies are you excited that's what I'm talking about. The Sheik Contends Conference uh, is going to be in Cornerstone, Hendersonville, just down the road. And so uh, if you are planning on going to that, which I suggest you do, you can see Miss Teresa. Make sure she gets your name uh, and money and all that good and fun stuff. Also, when you came in, hopefully, or if not, we'll get it to you. You should have got a little form uh, to fill out with your name. Uh, we're going to be having a drawing after service. Uh, you can win a gift card. Who wants to win a gift card? Yeah, look, y'all didn't y'all cheer louder for that than the than the sheet contents thing. Uh, somebody's gonna go get them some gas, Miss Sonia from Kroger. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, but make sure you fill that out. We'll pick those up at the end. If you didn't get one, uh, we'll make sure we get you one. Uh, you can run back to the Connect Center and we'll get you a piece of paper uh, for our drawing today. Also, where are my seniors at? My senior adults? Yeah, come on. Well, y'all living your best life right now. You got kids out the house. Yeah. I mean, come on. I, let me tell you, my parents are excited that me and my brother are gone. <laughs> they're living their best life now. They're not quite seniors, but they're getting there. And so, uh, uh, one, one, I wanted to say that we love you here at Belshire uh, Assembly. We are so thankful for your faithfulness and your wisdom uh, and, and all that you mean and do for this church. And so thank you for that. But I want to tell you, we're starting something special. Uh, here in the next couple of months, we're gonna, going to be introducing uh, a concept called small groups. Uh, and we're going to tell you all about that later in the year. Um, but our senior adults are going to start their small group a little early. They're going to be our test subjects. Uh, and they're going to start a small group on Sunday mornings here at the church at 9 o'clock. And so our senior adults, 9 o'clock here at the church on Sundays, is going to be your small group. Uh, And everyone else that's not a senior, your small group is coming. And I believe it's going to be a very impactful thing for the future of our church. And so get excited about that. It's going to be good. Um, I think that is all of our announcements other than a couple prayer requests and offering. Uh, I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Um, We are able to do ministry because of your faithfulness. Um, we, we got projects going on. We, we help the, the people that are in need. We do so many things, and we're able to do that because you're faithful. And so continue to be faithful. If maybe you've never given before, uh, let today be the day. How many know that God blesses when we give? Yeah. 
God, when we give sacrificially, God blesses that. So if you need a blessing today, give. It's as simple as that. It doesn't make sense in our worldly math system, but it does in heaven that when we give sacrificially and we give with a grateful heart, then something supernatural happens and God blesses us back more than we could probably even begin to quantify. And so if you've never given before, I encourage you to give today and see what God can bless you. There's a couple ways you can give. There's a bucket in the back. Um, we're not going to pass buckets for all the safety reasons, um, but you can give by check or by cash. If you would put it in the envelope that's in the back of the seat with your name on it, we'll give you giving credit. That helps with your taxes and all that good and fun stuff. If you don't want to do that, you say, Pastor Andrew, I don't carry cash because I don't carry cash uh, and I don't write checks because I also don't write checks. You can give online at belsharag.com slash give. Uh, it's super easy. It, it asks for your name, your address, your amount. You click enter. It's super easy, so make sure uh, you are giving uh, one of those ways. And again, we thank you so much for your faithfulness. Uh, last thing we want to do this morning before we get into worship, we just want to have a quick time of prayer. Uh, we've been praying for our missionary, Adam Tweet. Uh, he is doing better, uh, but still has a long way to go. And so uh, our prayers are working. Maybe not as quickly as we would like, um, but they are working, they're touching them. So we want to pray uh, for our missionary to the Dominican, Adam Tweet. Uh, and we also just want to pray for those who are being affected by COVID. I, I know we're tired of hearing about it. I know a lot of us are over it. Um, but for those that it's affecting your family, it matters to them still. And as much as we just want to move past it, it's still a real thing that's affecting people. Uh, and particularly this time around, for whatever reason, it's affecting children more than anything. And so uh, we just want to pray that God's hand would protect those. He would heal those, especially ours in the back, that his hand would be upon them. So can we just stand real fast uh, and just begin to pray for those two needs? And then we're going to get into worship. Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord, you are great and mighty and worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our worship. Lord, and I believe that you are a healer, that you bore the stripes on your back for our healing, that it's already been paid for. So I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, that you would touch our missionary Adam Tweet, wherever he's at right now. Lord, I pray that your healing hand would come. Lord, I pray that you would raise his oxygen levels. God, Lord, I pray that you would, would help, Lord, every symptom, Lord, that it would just cease to exist, Lord, that he would wake up feeling refreshed and rejuvenated, ready to do your work, Father God. Lord, I pray for his family, Lord, that you would just comfort them and strengthen them there in this time, God. Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you just do a miracle. Lord, so that he can go into another country and say, I know that my God is real because here's my story. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would bless and protect each and every one of our children, God. Lord, from this virus, Lord, I pray as they go to school that you would help them, Lord Jesus, Lord, to, to be responsible, to wash their hands and, and do the things that they need to do. God, Lord, I pray for every family that's being affected by this, Lord, that you would strengthen them, Lord, you would bless them. Lord, I pray for healing in their bodies, God. Lord, I pray just for your hand of protection to be on each and every one of our church family, Lord, our families that are extended from this house, God. Lord, and we thank you for it. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Can you stay in just that atmosphere right now of prayer? Come on, I feel there's some heaviness in some hearts in our church today. Maybe you've come today and you've got a lot of heaviness on it. Maybe it's something that, that Pastor Andrew touched on today. You've got a family member who's sick. Maybe it's not with COVID, but with cancer or some other illness. And, and I just want you today, for the next however long we worship, for the next 15 or 20 minutes, can you sit that worry and that care over here in the seat next to you and focus on the one who, who allowed you to be here today, who woke you up this morning? Amen who gave you strength to get into that car or that vehicle and make it into this church today. Can you just focus on the Father this morning and worship Him? Amen. Hallelujah, Lord, we love you. Yes. Oh, Jesus. I was walking the wayside, lost on a lonely road. I was chasing the highlight, trying to find from my soul all the lies I believed in left me crying like the rain. Yeah. Then I saw lightning from heaven, and I've never been the same. Yeah. I'm gonna climb a mountain, I'm gonna shout about it, I am a child of love. I found a world of freedom, I found a 
friend of Jesus. I am a child of love. Yes, I am. I felt the sting of the fire, but I saw. Shout about it. I am a child of love. I found a world of freedom. I found a friend of Jesus. I am a child of love. Yes, I am. Yeah. Oh, I am a child. change the way come on I'm gonna I'm gonna climb a mountain I am a child of love I found a world of freedom yes I did change the way I belong to you yes I do nothing can change the way I'm gonna climb a mountain I am a child of love I found a world of freedom Jesus, I am a child of love. Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. I am a child of love. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. I am a child of love. Oh, yes, I am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, can you just worship him?
Can you just worship him with your own words this morning? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
remember what he did on that cross for us can you believe that the father sent his son for you on that cross on Calvary that day he paid it all for you I hear the Savior sing thy strength in is small child of weakness watch and pray find me in thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin a crimson stain he washed it white as snow Lord now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots and bear heart of stone. Hallelujah. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And with 
before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat hallelujah Jesus paid it all
Come on, just lift your hands for a moment. Just love on Jesus. Just love on him for where you're at, for what he's done. Has he been faithful to you in any way? He deserves the praise and honor and glory. Not for just what he has done, but who he is. We thank you, Lord, for who you are, the risen Savior. We thank you that you're the creator of all of heaven and earth. We thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the one who made my dead and raised me life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who made my dead. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Was said nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other. Found I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. I said nothing but the blood of Jesus. I said now nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Bring my old book out. It has a bunch of old songs in it, don't I? I was trying to think of something else, but David just didn't come to me. If Chris hadn't started singing that one, I mean, he was trying, yeah. What, what key was that in? F, F sharp. Hallelujah. That may be the first time in my life I ever sang anything in F sharp. That wasn't too horrible. Praise the Lord. That's, that's the uh, only downfall of having a female worship leader is when I want to sing, it's never in a key that I like. And uh, so I have to adapt. Thank you, Pastor Andrew, for filling in this morning. Thank you for not wearing your pajamas in here. You say that's weird. Well, they're having pajama day in children's church. And so uh, I think, I don't know if you brought your child in pajamas. I, I heard maybe Callie was the only one that dressed up. I don't know. 
We're so glad that you're here today. It's going to be a, we, we have started a series every September. Uh, we do, we call Family Month. And this, this year's series is called For the Family. And we're, last week we talked about the six pillars of your family worship. And we're talking about things that you should do at home. How many of you know we ought to do worship definitely at church? And we ought to do it as much as we possibly can together. But at home, we ought to sing together, pray together, learn together, serve the Lord and others together, and we ought to love each other. Amen? And that is part of it. The other part is having fun together. We talked about that, you know, last week. And having, you know, some people say having fun's not spiritual. Sure it is. Man, it, it does something to your children when, you know, instead of chewing them out all the time, you have fun with them. Right? So praise God it is spiritual. But today, the second part of this, of our, our sermon series, is going to be called Loving Your Spouse. Now, I realize there are some of you in here who are not married, like me. And so you say, well, it doesn't apply to me. Well, it might someday, right? And then again, if it never does, that's okay. You can adapt some of these things to loving other people. I mean, it's just as important. We'll talk about next week, we're going to talk about loving your children. Biblically, how do we love our children? And then the last week, we're going to talk about how to love your church family. I mean, you know, that's important, how we love each other. Today, uh, I was, uh, Stuart Cusan and I were cleaning out a closet that had not been cleaned out since uh, I took over that office probably 12 or 13 years ago. It was an old nursery, and uh, it has uh, been piling up and piling up. I, I mean, there was so much stuff. But one of the great things is I found a great book that we're going to give away today. I've got several copies. And men, this is specifically for you. If you are a husband or if you ever want to be. Uh, it's called Seven Ways to Be Your Hero. The one your wife has been waiting for. It's a, it's a great book. And so I encourage you. You say, well, I'm already a great husband. Well, let's ask your wife. Uh, I mean, you can, you can be good, but we want to go to great. And I think there's things that we can all do. And today we're going to talk about how do you love your spouse. And I, I need to just preface this, that much of what I'm going to share today comes from Emerson Egrich's, I think is how you say his last name, book, Love, who? Edrich. Yeah, that's him. <laughs> I was going to say Egrich, but that's... I don't know if that's right. His book, Love and Respect, it's a great book. Whenever I'm doing premarital counseling with young couples, one of the things that I ask them to do is there's, there's three books that I ask them to read on top of our, our journey to oneness that we do. Love and Respect is one of them. By the way, if I've ever married you, you haven't read it yet, uh, it's not too late. Because if you've been married a long time, you should read this book. It is a wonderful book, Love and Respect, Five Love Languages. Man, if you can identify what the love language is of your, your spouse, you, you, you get not just brownie points, but you begin to learn how to adapt uh, to each other even better. And I have just forgotten the third book. How to work on the road. Who? How to work on the road? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, working on the building, working on the building. Uh, Billy, what's the third book? I forgot. What was it? All right, let's see. Love and Respect. Oh, um, um. It will come to me in just a little while. But today I want to talk about how to love your spouse. And I also need to tell you, I'm going to use a couple of Greek words that uh, I am not a Greek scholar. I, I did not go and study that. Uh, some of that I, I found in a reading of a, a pastor. He wrote some things about the headship and about Ephesians. His name is Kenneth Pell, Pastor Kenneth Pell. He's a Nazarene pastor. How many of you know us Pentecostals can learn something from Nazarenes? Come on now, let's, we, we got to know where we can learn. So we need, to, we need to develop some things in our home of family worship, but also how to love your spouse. Because I, I was telling someone how you love your spouse, and even if you're in a relationship with a boyfriend and girlfriend, how you begin to love them. Now let me just say, if you're a boyfriend and a girlfriend and you're not married, you're not married. Don't take married benefits. I'm trying to be gentle. But you, you, you do this and you look at if we come together even as, as 
a couple as you're dating or things like that, how you love each other, especially if you're married with children, is going to teach your children how they should be loved in a relationship and how they ought to love others. Can I tell you that we, we understand, and psychologists have said this, that the things that we do in secret, our children will do in excess. The things that we do, our attitudes, our, our, our hidden, not even just the hidden things, things we do openly. If you, if you have a, you know, a head full of anger, your children are going to either be cowered down to everybody in life and be afraid of everything, or they're going to multiply your anger in their life. And it goes for many things. If you, you know, it's the reason why the, if you see uh, someone who has a drinking problem or some other type of addiction, most likely their children are going to follow that path. Now, that is not 100%, but it is a pretty wide number. So we have to, as, as, as men and women, when we're talking about the family structure, we need to make sure that we're following biblical principles in how we live our life. Because it really matters. And part of that is how do you love your spouse? How do you love the one that you are married to? So now I'm just asking those of you who are not married, please don't check out on me today. Because there's some, there's some va valuable truths that you're going to learn today. So if you'll look, if you have your Bibles with me, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, we got the big Bible behind me. Yeah, some of you will get that later. Ephesians chapter 5. Hey, at the end of service, man, come get you a copy of this book. The box is right there. I, I was going to toss them out. I was afraid I'd hit somebody in the head. So I decided against that, and Chris fussed at me for having them on the stage, so he took them all. Thank you, Chris. Ephesians 5. Let's begin in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Well, there you go. That's all we need to talk about. Praise the Lord. How many of you know too often that's exactly where male preachers stop at? And we'll, we'll hound that point until every woman has to think they're a slave to their husbands. Now, I'm just going to tell you straight up, that is not what the Bible teaches. Submission is not slavery. Submission is not doormat. That's not what God means. If you're treating your wife that way or your girlfriend that way, stop it. Today. Or you and I are going to have a talk. I, I, that, that's not what that means. We'll talk about that, but I wanted to make sure because, man, I've heard so many I've heard so many preachers that hound that point and forget everything else or just kind of gloss over the rest of it. Listen, for the husband is the head of the wife. Oh, yeah, right, mm, head. And also Christ, the head of the church, he's the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. But husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. 27, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That means, men, you, you don't notice the pimples, I think, is what that means. <laughs> I'm joking. So husbands, it's okay not to notice them. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become flesh, one flesh. That's a really important verse. Because I'm going to tell you, I, I have... In, in doing premarital counseling through the years, I have found a lot of mama boys that ain't let go of mama. Come on, y'all don't want to admit that. I'm a mama's boy. I'll be the first to admit it. But I learned a long time ago through uh, much trial and error married to Lonnie that <laughs> my allegiance and loyalty was to my wife. But I did not have to sacrifice loving my mother. 
I, I, I have, I know people, and I've had, I've had somebody try to explain that scripture to me. See, that tells me I, I need to cut off my family and just cling to my wife. No, it doesn't. It didn't say abandon forever as if you don't know them. It says cling to your wife. That means she becomes your confidant. Don't go talk to your mama when y'all be talking to your wife. That goes, wives, don't go talking to mama and daddy when you ought to be talking to your husband. Right? It doesn't mean that they can't be a confidant, but they are not your first confidant. The one that God made you in covenant with is the one you need to be giving yourself and submitting yourself to completely. And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, for this is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his... Now, I want you to notice something here. We spoke about wives for just a moment. There was three verses. Everything else is either about Christ or men loving their wives. That's the reason I say it's been so unbalanced how that men have portrayed this set of scriptures when it comes to marriage. Now, I'm not here to beat up on men because I'm just going to tell you I'm a man. Okay, hopefully you knew that. I'm not a different pronoun. I am a male. But here, here's the thing is you have to learn how God wants us to act and to live as men and women in this world because you and I, through Christ, are betraying what the church and its relationship to Jesus ought to look like. And he said, and this is a great mystery. I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, if, if, you, if you see... Throughout the years, and I'll be 58 years old a week from today, and, and there's, a, there's such a clear, I think, contrast, I think, to some of the older views of marriage and even maybe what we thought the gospel said to what maybe we're becoming a little more enlightened. And some of the things that Paul wrote here were controversial even in that day because he was, you know, basically women were looked down upon. And, he, and, and people would, men would treat them like second-class citizens. Can I tell you, men, that the woman that God has given you is the, other than your salvation through Jesus Christ, is the greatest prize you could ever have in this life. And I speak from experience. You know, Lonnie, Lonnie passed away three years ago. Can I tell you that in our 30 years of marriage, 37 years of knowing each other, high school sweethearts, I understood, Billy, just how much I love her. I didn't say loved, love her. I still love her. She's still a part of my life. She will ever, forever be a part of my life. She was the jewel of my life. And it didn't take her death for me to understand that. I'm going to tell you early on, I didn't maybe know that. But the longer we were married, the greater I treasured her. And I think as we, as we get older and we begin to see exactly what God is, is instructing us, because I think God has given us a structure and a, 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 the instruction manual of how to be countercultural when it comes to how we treat each other in marriage. Because what we do, as I said a moment ago, reflects on who Jesus Christ is and the church and the Christian virtues and principles in which we're supposed to live our life by. Now I think this, these set of scriptures have been quoted so much, but they underscore the gospel's understanding and teaching about husbands and wives. God always used marriage to as an image of his relationship to man. Throughout Old Testament teaching and through New Testament teaching, God used the marriage. That's the reason why it's important. Look, no marriage is perfect. You know how I know that? 
because ain't none of us perfect. You're going to have failures. You're going to have times of struggle. You're going to have moments of alienation, as, as we say in the, in the you know, getting married world. You're going to have those moments where you're not going to agree. You're going to disagree. Oh, I remember the third book. <laughs> Men are like waffles. Women are like spaghetti. You want to know about that book? Ask me after church. It is a wonderful. If you want to understand how a man and a woman thinks, it's a great tool. Okay. Glad that came to me. Told you it would. God created this covenant relationship between man and himself. And through that, he is displaying that covenant between men and women in marital relationships. Now, I understand. Let me, let me say, I understand that, you know, some people get divorced and, and there's hard times in marriage and, and, and things. Because the truth is, not all two partners are willing to give everything they're supposed to in a marriage relationship. Right? And because of that, we have divorce. The Bible says it's because of the hardening of the heart that divorce was allowed. Because our heart becomes hardened towards the person that we're in covenant relationship with. That's the reason why it's very important, men and women, whether it be friendships, church relationships, or and especially marriage and, give, and your children, don't, don't allow your heart to become so hard because of circumstances that don't meet your standards in life. Because I'm going to tell you that in every relationship that you're going to have, and today we're specifically talking about marital relationships, but in every marital relationship, there will be moments that you just don't think we're compatible. Matter of fact, you're going to have moments you're going to look at that person and say, I don't even know if I like you. I mean, let's be, I'm just trying to be real about this. How many of you know, if we're not real with the gospel and how life really is, we're just playing pretend. I don't want to play pretend because we got enough people playing pretend. I want to talk about what it means to be in a real covenant relationship and how marriage, when Christ is the center of it, should look in our lives. Being in a covenant relationship as God's standard makes husbands and wives equal. <laughs> There's three amens. The rest of you not sure. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is, even in the church world, this isn't always taught. I've, I've, I've saw, you know, over the last four or five years, you know, Beth Moore, who's a wonderful Bible teacher, who is, she has, she has taken so much uh, uh, junk from pastors and, and Bible teachers and stuff that are nationwide because of her stance of men and women ought to be equal in a marriage. Yes, there is a there is the head of the house, there is the, the woman of submission. There are all the Bible teaches those things, but not in a role that means that you're the king and I'm your servant. God did not give one person dominance. Matter of fact, the scripture says we are one flesh. The two shall become one. And no man has, if you hate yourself, can love your wife. This is a really important point. It is very difficult when you do not like yourself and you don't love yourself, and I'm not talking about from an egotistical standpoint. There are some people who love themselves way too much, right? We all know those people. You may be one of them people. I'm not just, you know. But when we understand that if I don't like or love me, it makes it more difficult for me to like and love the person that I'm in partnership with and covenant relationship with. I was speaking to someone who's in a relationship and, and had some horribly tragic things that's happened over their life. And one of the things that, that they struggle with is they just don't like themselves. 
at all because of things that have happened. And it directly affects how they feel about the person they're in a relationship with. You say, well, well, how do I fix that? Well, you know, the number one way to fix learning to like and love yourself is to see the value that Christ placed on you. He, he liked you so much and loved you so much, he was willing to give his life for you. Think about that for a moment. Now, I know I'm not doing any wild preaching today. This is more of a teaching mode. Y'all just stay with me. I'll, I'll make it as entertaining as possible, but it's going to be factual. When you love yourself, it is easier to love the person you're in covenant relationship with. When you, when you look down upon yourself, when you think less of yourself, as if you're less than the person you're in relationship with or marriage with, it will be difficult for you to have a healthy relationship. Now, I'll be honest with you, mostly who struggle with this in marriages are women. I, I believe there has been a spiritual attack on women as long as I can remember because most women suffer from low self-esteem issues. They think less of themselves. I'm just going to tell you, women, women are the strongest beings on the face of the earth other than the Holy Ghost. I'm just, I mean, you think about all, I, mean, I know the old saying, well, you know, thank God men don't have to have babies. That's the truth. I'm grateful. I had to pass a kidney stone and thought I was going to die. If you've ever had a kidney stone, it's painful. I mean, I want as much drugs you can put in that IV to stop the pain. It's the reason I'm amazed when a, a woman wants to have a natural childbirth when all that good stuff is available. You're tough. I was having dinner with some friends last night. One of is a young lady. You know, she's about to get married, and she was talking about when she... They have children. She wants to do it naturally. I almost wanted to stand up and applaud because I, you, you know, that's tough. Now, women may not be as physically strong as some men, even though some of you are. I remember we, we took our, our uh, mission trip a few years ago to Columbia, South America, and Catherine and Lonnie were there, and Good Lord, they outwork most of the men. Ain't that right, Brad? I mean, them, them two women, fearless. They had this. They had the ricketyest old ladder that they handmade to get up on the top of this building. I'm just gonna be. I'm gonna be straight and honest with you. I did not climb that ladder. I was too big for that ladder, and me and Jesus knew it. And I made sure everybody else knew it. I'm not getting on that ladder. <laughs> But those two ladies, man, they scaled that. And I mean, they're up there toting beams. And I mean, we're, we're unloading a, a, a whole truck full of uh, blocks. And we're tossing blocks. And they're catching blocks. I mean, we, I mean when I say a truckload, I don't know if Catherine's back there because I can't see the whole the light. I, it was a truckload of block that they're going to build on this church. It was, they were incredible. There was this one particular guy that was there. I thought... Those two ladies were going to throw him off the building because <laughs> he just didn't produce anything and except for run his mouth and hit on Catherine. <laughs> so we're not talking about physical strength. We're talking about ladies learning to love yourself and have self-respect so that the person you're in covenant relationship will, with will love you and respect you. That's very important. And like I said, I understand that there's, there's all kinds of teachings on this, and I've heard, I've heard people over the years that just, they, they, I just can't stand when I hear people who are supposed to be Bible teachers put down women and think that's what the Bible says. It's no different than when people use the Bible to put down people of other colors and said that you're supposed to be our slave. That, the Bible never taught that. That was man's own hatred in his own heart towards people who they thought were uh, inferior to them. I'm going to say, I say this often, I'll say it again. If you have hate in your heart 
and you look down on people of other color just because they're not like you, you won't make heaven. You, you, will not, you won't get a chance to love them in heaven if you don't love them on this earth. That's not my message, but that needed to be said again. The Bible states that the husband is the head, and I know too many men who take that too far, and they take that as a license to be a tyrant, but that's really not what the Bible teaches us. Jesus is the portrayal of the head of the church. That's what the Bible says. And that Greek word uh, that, that is used is kaphel, kaphel, K-A-P-H-A-L-E, I believe is how it's pronounced. I'm not a Greek scholar, so if y'all think I'm cussing, I'm really not. And that word in Matthew, it, it comes in Matthew 21, 42 from the word capstone. He is the headstone, the cap of the church. The stone that the builders rejected became the capstone or the headstone, the main stone, the thing the builders rejected it. But Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. He is the cap hell of the church. And it also was used when, uh, the, to describe Roman civic leaders. And Paul used the word three times in reference to Jesus as being the clear cap hell or cornerstone or capstone of the church. Now listen. In Ephesians 1.22, and he put all things under his feet, and he gave him to be the head or the cap hell over all things to the church. Now, we're talking about marriage and spousal relationships. In, in marriage partnerships, women and men ought to walk shoulder to sh shoulder as one flesh. But as a covenant relationship, there are differing roles that God has established for men and women in the marital relationship. Now, one of those is for men to be the spiritual head of their home. Now, what does that mean? How, how is a man the spiritual head of his home? Well, that simply means that your responsibility is to make sure that you're leading your family to Jesus. Does that mean you have to always pray and you have to always have the last word and you have to always, you know, teach what the Bible says? No, don't set them down and give them your doctrine. It means that your responsibility is to lead them to Christ to the best of your ability. God has put you in that relationship in partnership with the woman that you're married to. Now, that doesn't mean that women can't give good guidance. Can I, you know, I talk in this about how when I'm doing premarital counseling, I will tell men, those of you who have been through it, I will tell men, listen, when your wife speaks, pay attention to what she's saying. Especially two born-again believers in Jesus Christ who are living for the Lord. Because I'm just going to tell you, I have found that women tend to be more spiritually sensitive to what the Lord is wanting to say. And all the women said, yep, mm -hmm, hallelujah. Thought some of you might dance. And, and because of that, women, don't be afraid to voice what the Lord is saying to you. Men, don't be afraid to close your mouth and open your ears. You are in this partnership together. Loving her means that I see her as my equal partner in what we're doing. Yes, I have my role. I am, I am a, as Jesus was the capel or the cornerstone, the capstone of the church. God has put me in that position as the husband over the family and over my wife. But women, you have the unrivaled role of being in this marriage and being an equal part, one flesh. I'm going to say that over and over again because if we're one flesh, we're not to be two individuals with you're going to do what I tell you to do. There's another Greek word that in talking about yielding in to your husband. And it comes from the word, I know I'm not going to say this right, but I'm going to do my best. Hupotasso, H-U-P-O-T-A-S-S-O. -S -S Probably not right. I start to say just hippopotamus, but I thought, <laughs> I thought the ladies would get mad at me. Hupotasso, tasso. And it means to yield and make oneself subject to one another. Now, I want you to hear me. And like I said, some of this stuff comes from love and respect and the Greek words and its meaning and this to, to, 
uh, comes from Pastor Ken, the Nazarene pastor. It does not mean a wife cannot give guidance. Listen to me. The wife is not in fear, but the Lord gives her the ability to yield, submit, but be equal. Can I tell you, the Bible doesn't teach for ladies for you to check your brain at the door when your husband walks in. If, if you're smart, be smart. Now, like I said, this is not anti-men. Men, we have our role. We need to play our role. We are the protector, right? God, is, God has pr uh, put in us that role of being protector. But can I tell you, I've seen way too many men talk about, oh, anybody come in my house, I'm going to kill them. I'm going to take care of my family. <laughs> but are you keeping the devil out of your house? I'm going to tell you, the devil comes in your house far more than you're ever going to have an intruder. Amen. How many of you know the devil doesn't just show up with a pitchfork and a pointy ears and a tail? He shows up in your attitude. How many of you know sometimes you can act like the devil? Men and women, come on now. I've seen some of you. You can go zero to crazy in 10 seconds. Right? I don't even know that's the devil. You say, well, he shouldn't have made me mad or he, she shouldn't have made me mad. What? That's possible. But it still doesn't give you the right to act like an idiot. <laughs> or to lose your cool to the point of ever, ever, you becoming the person who does the most damage in your house instead of somebody trying to break in. The greatest enemy we have to fight in our homes is us. And it comes from bad thinking, bad theology, bad actions. I'm talking men and women here. I ain't talking about one sex. I'm talking about both of you. I'm going to tell you, I've seen, I've seen women just go as crazy as men do. I've seen women swing at men and beat on them. Just as, not as much, but I have seen it take place. Can I tell you, there is no place in your home for either one of you to ever take a swing at your partner. It is sinful. It's the devil. You've submitted yourself to the work of the enemy in your home. So I would never. Unchecked anger will begin to produce violence. So I'd never. I hope not. Because if you're doing that in your home, if, if the two of you holler at the top of your lungs at each other, you know what you're teaching your children? That's how we're supposed to communicate. And when they have un unhealthy relationships, because mom and dad's relationship is unhealthy and unbiblical in the way that they deal with things, you know what? Don't pick on them because they ought to do better. It is never too late as, as for us to start doing better. We're the, we're the, moms and dads, you are the examples to your children. Let's be the godly ones. Let's show them what it means. Some of you, yes, you don't have a spouse. How many of you know some of you aunties and uncles and grandmas and, you know, supposed grandmas and all? I mean, we got all kinds of titles for each other. Whatever relationship you have in a family structure, let it be one that is biblical, living your life under submission to the word of God. Why? Because what you're doing is teaching somebody else the behavior that you expect to happen in your home. Excuse me. So the, the woman is under the word upatasso, and it references about meekness, but not weakness. 
How many of you know there's a difference? Meekness is, is defined as strength under control. A wife that you're married to is capable of doing so much. How many of you know that in, in Proverbs 31 when it talks about the wife, how many of you know women can earn more than men and it's okay? I have met men who are threatened when their wife makes more money than they do. I used to tell Lonnie, please make more money than I do. <laughs> All right, go for it. I, I mean... I'd love not, especially when I was working full-time and pastoring full-time, but please, I, do something that makes more money and so I can only do one of these. You know, it's, I was not threatened by that. I mean, you know, sometimes women have the jobs that maybe you don't have and they, they can earn. Proverbs 31 talks about a woman who not only submits to her husband and is beautiful and all these things that we say about Proverbs 31, but it says she brings home the bacon, fries it up in the pan. I mean, it don't really read that way. But he talks about the woman who, who is working and providing for her family. Now, I, you know, honestly, I, you know, one of the things that Lonnie and I talked about for years, we wish that we were in a financial position to where she didn't have to work. And she could have maybe homeschooled, especially the boys. They were much younger than Laurie and Sonia and have that opportunity. But, you know, when, when you marry a woman with four kids and then a mother-in-law that moves in a year and a half later, it's all hands on deck. We start sending Michael and Timothy out for jobs. We, need, we needed money. You know, go cut some grass or something. You know, we, <laughs> I mean, you had to do what you have to do, right, to provide for your family. But she's to be a vessel. So we see in Ephesians 1, as we read this again, and he put all things in subjection, or the hupotasso, the camp hell, oh, I mean the, the subjection, the meekness, under his feet and gave him the head or the capstone over all things in the church. Now, what does this mean to us? As, as, I, as I talked about and I've thought about this, some of the things that I've heard and I've, I've read in some articles about what men and women think when they look at their relationship, there's two things that I found, and, and this, this comes straight out of the love and respect, but I'm going to tell you I have found this to be true. I've heard men say over and over and over again that my wife doesn't respect me. And I've heard... Men say, my wife doesn't love me because we equate, men equate love with respect. There was a, there was a survey put out that over 81.5% of all men that were surveyed felt disrespected in their own marriage. They said deep down they felt secure in the love, but they didn't feel like she respected them. And when women were asked similar questions, the results or the percentages were almost identical except for they were reversed. She felt unloved when there was conflict, and she felt distance and rejection when there was tension in the marriage. So what does that mean? Can I tell you, men, for just a moment, real love is not bringing home flowers once a year or doing dishes to get your wife in the mood. Real love is to live your life as a sacrifice and serving your wife. See, that's what Jesus did. Jesus said, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church, and he gave himself for her. If you're married here today or you're going to be, can I tell you ladies, those of you who are not married yet, make sure that you find you a man. I'm, I'm going to give you my guidelines. Y'all listen. Y'all need to write these down. Number one, he needs to love Jesus as much or more than you do. Amen? If he don't, send him packing. 
you're unequally yoked, and you don't need nothing to do with him. Number two, he needs to have a job. He don't need to have to make the most money, but he needs to be willing to work. I mean, it's not, I have learned over the years as, as in doing counseling with families pre-marriage and after marriage, one of the things that women want is to feel secure. And they don't feel secure when, when men, you go out and you add debt to your house that you're not sure how you're going to pay for. My dad was the worst at that. He would come home with a brand new car and never tell my mom about it. He would walk up, pull, honk the horn, mom would go outside and he'd say, look what I bought you. Can I say tension was a little high in the house for a little while? And he would spend money. So make sure that he has a job. And he's, he, he understands the value of money and hard work. Number three, pay attention to how he treats his mama. And if he has sisters, how he treats them. Because however he treats them is how he will treat you. I, I'm going to just tell you, I've seen that to be a truth so many times. If a, if, a, if a boy or a young man will talk mean and ugly to his mama, what makes you think he won't talk ugly to you? Well, he loves me. He loves his mama. But he loves his mama doing stuff for him more than he really loves her. And he's going to expect the same of you. That was a side note. Those, that's, that's just a little sidebar. I hope you wrote that. You young people wrote that down. So guys, if you're in here, love Jesus more than any girl you may end up being with. Make sure she's got a job. You know, I, as you get older, <laughs> let me just, <laughs> as you get older, do a background check. <laughs> right? Come on now. If they've been in jail 50 times, send them packing. You say, well, you know, they've been redeemed. Well, maybe. Or maybe they're just in a little lull period. If they got debt out their ears, guess what? They want you to pay it. This, that's for you older folks that are looking for, maybe looking for spout. You younger people. You know, you just you know, if you're if you're going to marry somebody with a lot of student debt, make sure he's got a make sure he's got a degree in something he can make money at. If he if he gets a philosophy degree and he got fifty thousand dollars worth of, you know, student loan debt, he ain't gonna earn no money. He gonna end up at McDonald's. He gonna tell them people how how philosophical it is to put that hamburger on that sesame seed bun. Real love is sacrificial. I, you know what? They took the clock down. I have no idea what time it is. Oh, I'm good. I got a few more minutes. Is real sacrificial love. Real love, man, is taking that crown off your head that says, I'm, my home is my castle, and putting a towel around your waist and washing the feet of your wife. That's what Jesus did. That was the example. He served. He served. Real love's putting your interests aside so that you can honor and bless your wife. See, that's, that's the model that Jesus gave as being the cap hill or the capstone, the cornerstone of the church. I mean, love Real love is focused on providing the needs of your spouse. And I'm not talking about when serving when it's convenient or when you're trying to get something. Real serving is not when you, you're looking to benefit from what you're doing. Real serving is serving because you love them. I'm not talking about any other thing.
thing you suffer being self-sacrificial in your life towards her. There was an article written by a guy named Doug Flanders about 25 ways to express love to your wife. And he, he, he kind of brought it down into the word couple. I, I, I thought this was pretty cool. If you take the C, it's closeness. She wants you to be with her. How many of you know two people can live in the house and not be together? She wants, oh, in the couple is for openness. She wants to know what's happening in your world. She wants you to share, men, what's going on in your head. Now, ladies, I want to help you with something. This is really important. There's probably not a whole lot that's meaningful to you, right? Doesn't mean they're not thinkers. Men can be, they're, most men can be very deep thinkers, but it may not make a bit of sense to you because they may be thinking about some job they're working on or something to them that matters. But men, can I tell you that women want to know what's going on in your world? They want understanding. Don't try to fix her. Boy, it's a biggie. Women, don't try to fix him. God did not give you a spouse to fix them. You can't fix somebody. Can I tell you, if, 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 oh, listen to me. If they're, if they're broken before you marry, you marry them ain't going to fix them. I'm just, that's men and women. I'm not, I know, I know I'm specifically in this moment talking about husbands, because I'm going to tell you, guys, listen to me. Men, women, listen, you can't fix somebody. All you can do is fix you. And once you fix you, then y'all can fix each other together. She wants peacemaking. Here's, here's a, here's a, she wants you to say sometimes, I'm sorry. Now, how many of you know I'm sorry are empty words if you keep doing the same thing over and over again? You're just trying to stay out of trouble. I'm sorry means just like it should when we say that to the Lord and we repent of our sins. I'm sorry I did that, Lord. Help me not to do it again. And when we say that to our wives, can they say, it's okay to say, you know, Love means I'm going to say when I'm wrong, I'm going to admit it. Have you know most men, we have to admit our pride many times keeps us from admitting when we're wrong. Most, most of all, and this is probably true of both sexes, when we're wrong about something, the first thing we want to do is deflect onto the other person. Somehow it's your fault that I'm wrong. Just say you're sorry and be done. She wants loyalty. She needs to know, man, that you're committed to her. And you know what? The last thing she wants, esteem. She needs to be honored and cherished as your precious jewel from heaven. Now, women, listen to me, wise. I talked about, men, what your expectation and should be doing. But I believe that God's Word and his instructions were spot on when the Bible tells that husbands to love his wife. But I also think they're spot on when it says, Husband, wives, respect your husband. Respect is a part of that meekness, strength under control of giving of yourself. Can I tell you, ladies, you need to understand men are geared toward needing respect. You know, men. Men will get out in the streets and kill each other because they think somebody disrespected them. That's what gangs do. You got on my territory. Right? I mean, they do it all the time. It happens right here in Nashville. People kill each other because they think they're disrespected. How many, we have seen road rage. Man, I, 
have, have you seen more? I mean, it's crazy. People shooting at you because you pulled over in front of them. And it's because they feel disrespected that you didn't see them, and they'll shoot at you. See, I think men are wired to need respect. Because I tell you, ladies, when you look down on your husband or you demean them, scold them, ignore them, or distance yourself from them, you are helping your relationship to erode because you are disrespecting him. So I tell you, it's amazing how much a man can flourish in a relationship when that his wife begins to truly respect him. And you say, well, he doesn't do anything worth respecting. Sure he does. He may not do everything you want, but I mean, you know, a little praise and a little respect over some small things can help produce some bigger things. But if you are all the time beating him down over things he's not doing, guess what he's going to do? He ain't going to do things to please you. This is just reality. When you were, this is an old school term, remember when you were courting? <laughs> you young people, if you don't know what courting is, ask your mom and dads. Dating. Remember when you were dating and things that drew you to that person? Maybe we need to go back to remembering what drew us together in the first place. If what drew you together as a couple outside of marriage was that you were Very passionate. <laughs> that doesn't last forever. And what kind of relationship will you have if that's what it's built on? If your relationship is built on sex, when you get married and you start having kids and life changes, what have you built? Now, here's, here's a few Here's a few ideas, ladies. We're going to use the acronym WIFE. I did, this is not mine. I stole this. Here's some suggestions. WIFE. W, work. If you work at, if you're a home mom or wife, that's praise God. If your husband makes enough money for you to stay at home, but that don't mean you sit around watching soap operas and eating bonbons all day. <laughs> I mean, if you're a stay-at-home wife, your house ought to be clean. Now I realize that there are times maybe you go through different, you know, physical, psychological, emotional things, and you have to deal with those things. You know, if, if, a, if whether a man or a woman, it doesn't matter when depression sets in, uh, which can happen, especially when there's hormonal changes in a woman's body, you can deal with all those things postpartum after children. A lot of those things, there may be a series of time and things that happen that that depression keeps you from that. But I'm going to just tell you, it's okay to work. Honor, but also honor his desire to work and achieve for y'all. Praise him. Man, bless God, if he, gets, if he gets a nickel raise, praise him for that. You say, that ain't much. He ought to demand 10 cents. Maybe he should have. But be grateful when your man is hardworking and wants to help take care of you. The I for intimacy. Recognize a man's need for sexual intimacy. Now, I'm trying to be as gingerly around this subject as I can. Because everybody has different needs and different uh in your age, different things, and that's okay. But ladies, I'm just going to tell you, your man has a desire. And at some point, you've got to help meet that desire. And, and can I tell you, though, husbands, the more that you love on your wife and serve her, the more she's going to want you. If you show up after having ignored her for days, 
and you ain't done nothing, she works just as hard as you do outside, and she's taking care of the kids, and you plop yourself down in that easy chair with your glass of sweet tea and watch TV until you're ready to be intimate, and you expect her to fire up the engines, she won't. But ladies, recognize the need for physical intimacy that a man needs, not just because of sex, because it does something to his self-esteem for his wife to want him. That's a big thing. And you say, well, we're past all that. Well, then kiss him till his toes curl. <laughs> I mean, show him that you want him, you, you love him. I'm not trying to be crude. Please don't, don't take it that way. I mean, you know, we're just, these are real life issues that are ruining marriages if we don't get it right. Here's a big one. Friendship. Be your husband's best friend. Husbands, be your wife's best friend. It's okay to have best friends outside the home. Yes, it is. But nobody should be closer to you than your spouse. The last one is being an executive. E, respect a man's desire to lead and want to lead the home. I, I've had in years past, especially when I've, I've seen couples get married. They both were lost. She gets saved. She's radical for Jesus. He's not. She begins to browbeat him about coming to church and beat him down, beat him down. One day he submits. He comes to church. He gets saved. But he's not as spiritually advanced as you think you are. And women have a hard time once a man begins to try to take his place in the home as God designed, giving up that role. Because let's just be honest with you. Some of you like to be bossy. And you know what? Sometimes we need that boss. I'm just going to tell you, Lonnie was bossy. <laughs> right? But it was a healthy... Now, early on, it wasn't real healthy. <laughs> After a few years...